Hello and welcome to another video in the series about the procedural planet asset for Unity. In this one, we'll be talking a little bit about the demo scene that's included. There might be more demo scenes by the time you're looking at this, if uh, it's been added. Uh, but if I load the demo scene, this one is designed to run both on uh, computers and also on, it's been tested on Android and it might work on iOS as well. So it supports the touch interface uh, to get you started if you want to try to compile it to uh, a mobile device as well. First, let's just press play here and uh, talk a little bit about the demo scene itself. Uh, basically, it allows you to do a few things. Uh, it'll show a FPS counter so you see what the performance is like. Uh, this one is a little bit misguiding because if you look in the stats here, it says about 200 F <laughs> FPS here and in Unity Editor it is actually saying 2000 FPS. So as you can see, it's a uh, in the editor, it's not really reliable, but when you compile it to a mobile device, and uh, that's more when it's useful to see up here. So basically you have a very simple interface here. You can create a, a random planet. So if you click on that one, it'll just take one of the blueprints that we've uh, talked about before, and it'll create a planet based on that blueprint. If we cl click, click random again, it'll do the same. And here, pick the terrestrial uh, blueprint. Down here in the left, it'll say how long it took to build this planet. And this planet took uh, just under a second to create all the textures for. Uh, the resolution is set to, all the textures are set to 512 by 512, which is uh, in the mid range of what the uh, procedural planet is capable of. Uh, the higher you go, the more video RAM or video memory will be used, and also the generation time will be longer and longer. If we take this planet, for example, and we increase it to 1024 by 1024 you'll see that it rebuilds textures and this time it took uh, 1.5 seconds to create in a high resolution and if we go up to 2048 you'll see the fidelity changes on the shoreline and the clouds are a lot more detailed but it also takes longer to generate and this one at the maximum so all textures now use 2048 by 2048 and it took about seven to eight seconds to create this one there's a slight benefit if you go from from a texture value and just increase the texture value without changing the properties of a planet. So if I were to create a, a totally new random planet, for example, you'll probably see that uh, generation time is longer. So stepping in resolution on an existing planet is faster. Uh, what you could do, since this is, uh, this is done in the background, so your game will continue to run even if the textures are regenerating. One way you could do it is by creating low quality planet first. Maybe you spawn it at when you approach it at uh, in the distance, even at this low resolution, if you're far away from the planet and approach it, it doesn't really matter if it's, uh, maybe that's a little bit too low, but around this, you know, uh, 128 size. So as you approach a planet, you can initiate to, to change the resolution of the planets. And that'll give you time, basically. I, I know that games like uh, EVE Online, for example, the reason why you have a, a hyper jump you know, with your spaceship that takes a little while, it's not just to have the pretty visual of a, of a jump speed effect, it's because they need to, to generate some of the planets during that meantime. So you could, uh, as you travel in space and as you uh, transition between locations in space, you could set the planet uh, engine to start um, rendering the textures without it really impacting the performance of your game. Let's switch it back to 512, let's see. And uh, this demo also shows two very simple uh, overrides. Uh, so I've mentioned before as well in a video that there are nearly 100 different properties that you can change to that creates all the appearance of a planet, how much land mass it should be, the liquid level, the, uh, how many, this one's got extremely many city lights, for example. But in this demo, since it's designed for mobile as well, uh, it's just got two overrides as a demo. The first one is the liquid level. So you can change just how much liquid is on the planet. And the second override is the clouds coverage. And worth knowing here is that uh, some of the parameters are a lot faster to animate than others or change. So liquid level, for example, most of that is done by the GPU shader, uh, but it does need to, to uh, create a, a lookup texture, which it does uh, every time this value is changed, but it's a fairly fast operation. So you don't want to do it all the time, but you could animate this one in real time. As you can see, I'm still keeping 
the frames are about the real frames per second here 1700 and if i pull the slider it dips down to about 700 frames per second but as you can see you can animate uh, the liquid level probably in real time if you wanted to have a planet that vaporized from vaporized all the liquid away from climate change <laughs> so the second one is uh, clouds coverage this one is a much heavier operation even though on my computer it runs fairly fast once you get started anyway if we increase it to 2048 here you can see let's have a look you see that it's it takes about 0.08 frames or seconds to regenerate that one which is still quite fast uh, the, I think I mentioned before, before let's create a new random planet here and now you'll see that it takes longer than when I just changed the texture resolution here this one will probably end up in there because now it needs to rebuild the composition texture two biome textures it needs to rebuild the rings the lava texture which is not actually seen at the moment and also the clouds so this one take took at maximum resolution 14 seconds to regenerate it doesn't use the gpu at all uh, the implementation of the uh, procedural materials by unity uh, has all the texture generation in the cpu so you don't benefit from the gpu in a way i, I guess uh, it's good in a way that uh, you don't need to have really fast graphic cards to generate planets fast so uh, but i'd like to see that maybe change in the future that you could have that as an option if uh, they decide to implement that so we created uh, a different planet here and the first time i pull this override clouds coverage you might see that it's a performance dip here see now that it took a bit longer for it to to update but as i do sub uh, subsequent you can actually nearly animate this one in real time now as well on on high performance computers you definitely don't want to an animate too many of these at the same time if it's uh uh, I should uh, let's have a look if we pause this one and look here I mentioned this in the last video as well but if you look in the documentation folder under the properties document it'll say which properties that are requiring a texture rebuild here so be careful with those if you're going to change them from a script uh, so you don't do it too often or too frequently because it will impact your game performance back to the demo Let's have a look at the actual script behind here. Uh, one final thing is that uh, we created a bunch of random planets here. Basically, every time I click this button, it'll destroy whatever planet's on the scene and it'll create a new random one. And as you can see, you see the updates happening on the screen now. One way, if you wanted to, to do it, is uh, that you could hide a planet, for example, while it's... Uh, uh, building if you don't want to see it or you could have something else going on in the future uh, maybe you have a a GUI or something uh, and then you build a planet and show it in the background so you can decide how you want to do it but uh, by default it'll show you as the planet generates them so uh, the, the other alternative here is just to create a planet from JSON and that's basically because um, in the script it'll have a which we'll be looking at next, uh, it's got one that's created using a very specific JSON string. So all the parameters have been predetermined for this planet. And uh, if I were to stop and start, it'll always look the same. And another thing worth knowing is that uh, the most recent texture is always cached. So if I stop this one now, and then I start it again, that planet should load a lot faster. Um, you shouldn't need to rebuild all the textures because it uh, caches them. So, so it took 2.4 seconds instead of nearly 10 seconds. So that's worth knowing as well. By default, it's configured so that the procedural textures are cached with whatever planet was generated last. So let's have a look at the script behind this. Um, or let's look at the scene first of all, the scene components. Let's disable maximize on play. And we have the procedural planet manager, which is the required component. We've got the local star, which is just a, a position more or less with intensity and color um, to tell the shaders where to light the planets from. And then we have a demo object, which contains uh, the main script that drives uh, what we saw j just before when we were playing it. A directional light that doesn't actually have any, that's just created by default. It doesn't have any impact on, on this scene. 
FPS display is just a helper that shows the frames per second up in the left corner. The canvas object is just uh, to, um, to have these uh, UI objects. Event system is required for the canvas and the UI interaction. And then finally we have uh, a, a main camera. Which normally the main camera is just uh, at the bottom of the hierarchy. But uh, I threw it under a camera parent here, which is in the center of the scene. And as you can see, the camera parent is over here. And that's because it, when we press play here, it's quite easy to, uh, um, to orbit this way. So when you swipe the finger on the mobile device or when you click and drag here, as you can see, the camera rotates around the planet, and that's because we're actually ro rotating this around the y-axis of the parent, and the camera just follows along a, on the ride. So it's just an easy way to get a get the orbit working. That's the only reason why it's parented like that. And then we have the procedural planet here, and as you can see, this one exa exists during the play, but if we press stop, it destroys that one. So uh, it's because the planets are generated on runtime now, every time the uh, or this demo scene is run. So we can look at, uh, let's look at the canvas object and we've uh, got the buttons here. So we've got a button to create a random planet and uh, on click, the on click event for this one looks in the demo object and it, cr uh, it calls this function here called, uh, or th this method called create random planet. And if we open up this script, I've documented uh, all the scripts, uh, so including this demo script to um, sort of walk you through anything. Hopefully, it should be uh, documented enough so you can sort of understand why certain lines are in and, and what they do. And I'll talk you through a little bit about this one now. <clears throat> Basically, this uh, create planet from script demo script contains some references to the UI objects, uh, to the camera parent, so we can do the orbit rotation, and it has some some private variables just to control the drag and speed, the drag speed and a reference to the planet. In the start method, which always it's always executed by Unity when uh, you press play on on a scene or on the game, and the first thing it does when it starts, it's, it calls this method called create planet using base sixty four encoded JSON. And if we go and have a look at that, I'll scroll down. To, you can press F12 in Windows anyway, in to jump to jump to that method. So the purpose of this method, um, it creates a planet based on previously exported base64 encoded JSON string, exported via the inspector of a planet in the Unity editor, and it should be a closing bracket there. Uh, and as we saw here on the UI button, we had create this one, this button, button create JSON planet. And the on click comment on this one looks at the demo object, the demo game object, and it calls this create planet using base64 encoded JSON. And that's the one, that's the public method that we were just looking at here. So whenever that button is clicked, it will see if there is uh, a planet in the scene already. If this uh, planet object is set to null, or is not null, uh, that means that there is a planet in the scene, so destroy this one immediately and destroy. The planet is actually the, uh, the planet component of the game object, so we need to reference to destroy the actual game object, not just the planet component script itself. So if there's a planet in the scene, destroy it. And the next thing we want to do is we want to call the manager. So the manager dot instance, which is the singleton instance of this manager. There's only one. Uh, and then it calls the method called create planet and the position vector three zero. So in the center of the scene. And here is a, a 4000 character long string. Uh, if you looked at the uh, planet customization overview video that I made earlier, uh, it, sh it, it it demonstrates how to export this uh, base64 encoded JSON string there. And basically you can just copy it from there and paste it into your script when you create a planet like this. And as you can see, it's a, a really long, 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 long string. It just looks like uh, rubbish, but it's actually uh, encoded into this format. So you can copy and paste it into an editor. 
yeah, so this string here contains what blueprint was used uh, and all the different parameters for that particular planet to make sure it always looks the same. And the next thing we do is, uh, well, also we, we set this reference to uh, to the uh, planet variable here as well. So this one, when you call the create planet, it returns the planet component uh, that we can that we probably want to keep in a, in a variable here called planet in a private variable. And that's because we can do stuff like override parameters. Uh, we can access methods to do that uh, if we've kept a reference to it here. Uh, another thing we're doing here is uh, we're calling a method of the planet that we just created called subscribe message on texture build complete. And what that means is that when the planet generates textures, when it starts to generate a texture, either from when you just built the planet or if you're changing something like uh, we described before when you change the uh, the cloud coverage for example then it will it will keep track on whether it's uh, building or not and it, the planet will notify you or it will notify this game object that has this component when it's finished when the texture build is complete and you get this by calling this method after you've uh, when you've got a reference to to the planet that you've created so subscribe message on texture build complete so when this planet has finished building, it will call this method here on texture build complete with the argument called float and uh, of the data type float and it's the time that it took to generate. So whenever the planet is fin finished building, you can actually have it tell you via the unity send message feature. It'll tell this component then that, okay, it finished the build job of the textures. What this demo script throws into the debug log to say planet done regenerating textures and it took so many seconds to do it if we do this let's press play you'll actually see here now so we press play we click this create planet from json which is the one we just looked at and as you can see now it went so fast because it already had the textures generated so we just uh, basically realized okay uh, i don't need to do anything but I've done the build process and down here we see the uh, editor or the console log as well, the debug log to say that it took uh, 0 0.10 seconds. So let's go back here. There's not much more to it uh, for the for this. Uh, we create the planet here and we just subscribe to the on texture build and that's it. Um, that's all that's required to build a tech uh, to build a planet from a from a string. What I should mention maybe here about the on texture build complete uh, method when that one gets called we, we threw the log uh, the bug log message and then I set something called ignore override flag here and that, this is just for this demo script uh, it's because I want to update these two slider values that are here when it's completed the build of a um, of a planet I want it uh, to display what value it is actually for the liquid level and the cloud coverage and by setting this here the the liquid level value to the property then um, if, I, if I don't have this ignore flag on and take care of that later on that means that it, it would actually set the value as if I was dragging the slider and then it'll call for another texture rebuild because it thinks that okay I, I pulled the slider um, when in fact all I wanted to do was just set the slider value through the script but unity doesn't uh, see it that way <laughs> uh, whether you want it or not uh, you can't detect whether it's been set by script or if it's actually dragging so I decided to just throw this ignore override flag while I set the values and then I set it to false again here. So uh, basically it just won't, uh, won't call for another texture rebuild. That's the only reason why that one's there. Okay, so let's look at uh, the other one then. So the other button that we had there was uh, create random planet. And when we clicked on that one, it calls this one create random planet and it's basically very similar to the one before but even simpler uh, it destroys a planet if it's already in the scene and then instead of creating it from the JSON string that we had uh, it just creates it uh, cre it calls create planet uh, of the manager at vector uh, three zero which is in the center of the screen and then it just creates a random planet that's all you need to do and same as before once the planet has been created, we add this game object to subscribe to the message on texture build completes. So this method done that we had down here is called every time uh, the build job is finished. Let's go back to the start method uh, where we started when, uh, this video. 
and that's when you start the scene. It creates the planet using the base64 encoded JSON, which we saw. That's what throws that white planet up on the screen. And we're still in the start process here. And uh, basically what I'm doing here is I'm adding uh, a listener to the, to the two sliders and also to the drop down for the resolution. And you can do this by uh, detecting on the slider uh, if on value is changed, then add a listener to call a delegate uh, method. So whenever this is, this is what the Unity and C Sharp event system does by itself. So whenever I pull this slider here for override liquid level, it'll s realize that it's got a listener for the on value change for the liquid level. And when that when it detects on value change, when it that's detected, it'll actually call this method called override liquid level. And if I press F12 on that one, we can jump to the override liquid level. And all that does is when I pull that slider, uh, it'll have a reference to this uh, planet object that we that we need, and then it'll call the method called override property float, and then it'll have the uh, property in what's called camel case when you've got a lower uh, first letter and then every subsequent word has got a capital letter and without spaces so it'll set the property float called liquid level to the value of the ui slider liquid level and that's all you really need to do to override a value it's you call you use the reference to the the planet component and you call the override property float method you submit as an argument the the, uh, the property you want to change and then you set the, the float value that you want it to be changed to. So every time I pull the slider now, let's do it again here. So as I pull this one, because we had the uh, on listener on change value and the delegate to call the override value method, as I pull this one, it calls this one and it just overrides that float then. And same thing goes for the override clouds coverage. We have here, we've got the UI slider clouds coverage on value change. We add a listener uh, with a method, uh, delegate method to override the clouds coverage. So whenever we pull that slider, it detects that it's being changed and the, the delegate calls, or the listener calls this uh, override clouds coverage. And he, he, here, as I mentioned before, we had this ignore override flag set and that's basically if we don't want to rebuild textures when we set them by script so if that flag here override flag is set to true and i change these values here or particularly this one basically it'll still call this method because of the nature of the uh, on change and the listener but it'll detect that this override flag is set so it'll just return straight away it won't actually call for a rebuild of the textures but if I'm actually pulling the slider with the finger on, or with the with a mouse in this case, the override flag is not going to be set, so it continues to this one, and then it just does the same as for liquid level. It calls the override property float, and then it changes the in this case it's the clouds coverage property instead, and it sets it to what, whatever the value of the clouds coverage is. So this is overriding a value. Maybe you want to get the value that it was before you you override it. Maybe you want to know what the original value is. And you can also see that on here, because after the build is complete of a texture, I call, I want to obtain what the values are of the new planet here. So click random planet, see now toop, sliders jump to a new position here. If I do it again, you'll see them after the build complete, they'll jump to a new position. And that's because in this on texture build complete, uh, we set the value of the sliders and we can get that value from the planet so instead of overriding the property float, we, 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 we call the method called get property float for the liquid level. And that's how you can get the value. So you can get property float to get the value and you can override the property float here to a new value. And then finally, we also have the texture resolution. So uh, in play mode here, I can select all the way down to 16 by 16 textures, <laughs> 32, 128, 512. And whenever that's ha done, I can actually show here as well, drop down resolution. We've got, no, we don't. It's actually in here. 
So in the start, we had the UI dropdown resolution on value changed. We add listener to the value change of that dropdown, and then we call the delegate uh, set texture resolution, which was, if I press F12 on this one, jump down to it. And it's uh, it calls this uh, method to set the resolution. And this one just calls the manager, the instance of the manager, and sets resolution of the biomes to the dropdown value. And it says the resolution of the cities, clouds, continents, and lava. I don't actually change the polar caps in this demo, uh, in this demo one. And here's a little uh, indicator of uh, uh, what the values actually are. So if you set the resolution to zero, that means that it's 16 by 16 pixels. And then you've got the list here all the way up to seven, uh, which equals a uh, texture resolution of 2048 by 2048. When you've set these variables in the manager, you need to call the update procedural texture uh, of the planet that you're working with to make sure that it actually regenerates the textures. And if you, you could either s submit to the uh, argument of the biome one, two composition, uh, cloud cities, lava or polar ice on their, on their own, or you could just have the all, all string here. And that'll basically force uh, regeneration of all the, all the procedural materials. Uh, so this is important after you change the resolution, then you need to call the update procedural texture method of the planet. Uh, when you change the resolution here in the manager, let's press stop here. When you change this resolution here, um, the editor script actually calls that for you to rebuild any uh, existing materials. So, but if you're doing it by yourself in a script, then you need to call this. And this last method here is just uh, to detect when uh, I found that in a, uh, in a blog post, or sorry, in a forum post, I think it's just a helper to say, uh, so the clicks don't go through, especially on the Android. When you pull a slider, I didn't want the, uh, uh, I didn't want uh, the planet or the camera to rotate when I pulled the actual slider. And by doing uh, this uh, raycast, you can detect if you're over a UI element and then uh, uh, just ignore uh, the um, uh, the events. Then. So, yeah, I think uh, that concludes uh, the just a walkthrough of this demo scene and this uh, just a very basic level of scripting and uh, how to get the UI to interact and how to create a planet, a random planet, and how to create a, a planet from a JSON string within a script. So I hope that helps you out a little bit and. Uh, I'll, uh, in the next video, I'll talk more about the architecture of the, of the assets and why it's designed the way it is. So uh, thanks for watching and uh, take care. Bye.